CEO Rich Paul made progress in their talks in recent days to bring all-star Ben Simmons back to Philadelphia, sources told ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. Who else? We now welcome in Woj for more on this ongoing story. Woj, what led to this reversal from Ben Simmons' camp? Uh, Max, certainly money plays a part in this. Uh, Ben Simmons is losing $363,000 a game. And tonight when he misses that Nets game uh, in Philadelphia, you know, that puts him over a million dollars Uh, this season and lost money because you do lose money for the preseason games. But there's been a conversation going on really throughout this process between the 76ers front office and Rich Paul, uh, uh, Ben Simmons' agent, the the CEO of Clutch Sports, about trying to find a way to get Ben Simmons into Philadelphia, get him into the marketplace and go from there. Remember, the team has not talked to Ben Simmons other than that one meeting they had in late August where he reiterated that he wanted a trade. The Sixers would like to get him back in town. Uh, you know, Obviously, he can uh, stop the bleeding financially by doing that and then get him back onto the floor. You know, But right now, you know, I think there's optimism, some hope, you know, that Ben Simmons could be back in Philadelphia, Max, by the end of the week. Well, nothing to sober you up like losing $363,000 a day. That'll get you sober in a, in a heartbeat about a situation. Um, Woj, are the Sixers still planning to trade Simmons once they get him in the fold, if they do? Or is there hope they might convince him to stay in Philly? And is that what they want? Well, Max, the, the Sixers' goal throughout this has been to try to continue to win with Ben Simmons. And... Uh, and, and make the improvements in his game that certainly need to be made uh, that are difference makers in the postseason. Uh, listen, Ben Simmons hasn't changed his stance about wanting to be traded. That's clear. But getting back into camp, uh, potentially playing again, you know, that ultimately is one way to maybe get a trade moving quicker. Philadelphia's talked to the entire league. They've canvassed uh, throughout to, to make a trade for Ben Simmons. And they've not been able to find the kind of player that they would want back. Remember, they want to get back a star kind of player who can they can plug in with Joel Embiid and continue to be championship contenders. That's a hard trade to make because any team who has that player, they want to add Ben Simmons to their team. They don't want to give that up. And so that has certainly slowed trade talks down. Philly could get a young, good young player or two. They could get multiple draft picks. That's not what they're looking for. But right now, they want to try to repair that relationship with Ben Simmons. Doc Rivers, Daryl Morey, Elton Brand, you know, their group there want to get him back in and at least start talking with him again and see if they could get some buy-in. That will start initially with Ben Simmons getting on a plane in L.A. and going to Philadelphia. Uh, Some point in the near future, there's hope that that's going to be here in the next several days. Yeah, one. I mean, thanks, Woj. It just occurs to me. One of the problems may be that, you know who would have traded for Ben Simmons if he was on the market and devalued? Daryl Morey. Daryl Morey. Oh, Ben Simmons is undervalued. Let me grab him. The problem is he works for the Sixers. The great Adrian Wojnarowski, ladies and gentlemen. The 76ers open the season at New Orleans on October 20th. Their home opener is two days after that against the Simmons continues to be the top story. Now, Shams is reporting that Sixers stars plan to take a jet to L.A. to try and get Simmons to go back on his trade request. But they were rebuffed by Simmons and his camp. So Joel Embiid, the Sixers' mainstay, their guy, had this to say at media day. I really hope he changes his mind. I do love playing with him because he adds so much to our team. We've been building this team around us. I don't see it as this is my team. I don't care about any of that. Shams, the drama is real with this group. So what more can you tell us about this story and Ben Simmons? Yeah, those players, Joel Embiid included, Tobias Harris, Tyrese Maxey, uh, Danny Green, they wanted to fly out to L.A. last week to meet up with Ben Simmons face-to-face and really try to pitch him on coming back and committing to this 2021-2022 NBA season. But it's clear he does not want to be there. I'm told he's mentally checked out. And listen, whether he's he ultimately returns to Philadelphia at some point, because there will become a time where they could start docking his pay. And that is 225,000 plus every single game. But 
even when he returns, he will not be that same dedicated Ben Simmons. And it would not surprise me if, if, if he's still on that roster in November, December, January, and he ultimately does report back to the Sixers, he'll just end up in street clothes and, and have maybe some ailment. Uh, but so that's what the Sixers are navigating is you have a guy that's clearly, uh, you know, has one foot in one foot out, uh, or in this case, both feet out and his teammates have tried to get through to him. They just have not been successful. Yeah, it just sounds like a classic case of knowing when to hold them and when to fold them. And it sounds like the Sixers are not really ready to fold them yet. So, Pat, when we talk about the reports that we've heard about the trade talks with Ben Simmons, is that Daryl Morey is asking for too much in return for Simmons. So as this process plays out, as we get closer to the regular season, how do you think things will unfold with Simmons and the Sixers? Well, you know, it's clear right now that all of the leverage is in the, in the Sixers position. Um, ben Simmons is under contract for the next four years. Uh, he really doesn't have any means to get out. It, it, as Shams mentioned, if he chooses not to play, the Sixers can dock his pay, and, and he can just be on the sidelines. And, and even without him, I don't think that they're, uh, they're, they're by no means a championship contender, but they have a chance to be a pretty good team. And so as time goes on, as they, get, they, they play with one another, if they have success, um, I think that that just strengthens the Sixers position and it leaves Ben Simpson in a position where, you know, he, he really has a difficult choice because as Shams mentioned, if he comes back, he's coming into a team with teammates that, uh, that are going to question his commitment to the team. Uh, and that's not, not even talking about uh, the wrath that he's going to get banned. So, so right now he's in a really difficult position, you know, for him, as soon as he gets back to playing, I, you know, the, the stronger his trade position is going to be. But right now he's not in a good position. Yeah, and Shams, we saw during media day for the Sixers that Daryl Morey tried to have some reconciliation with Ben Simmons in that situation. So I, we heard you say that, you know, right now it's really two feet out for Ben Simmons with his deal with Philadelphia. So do you realistically think that he could play for the Sixers at some point? So could he play? Listen, he's got four years left on his deal. Could they just wait him out for two years and ultimately see his way back onto the floor? Of course, to me, Cam, this is a game of chicken. Who's going to blink first? Who's going to blink in this staring contest first? And who's going to make that first move? Is it going to be Ben Simmons going back to Philly in some way, shape, or form? Or is it going to be the Sixers deciding we're going to just have to get rid of uh, Ben Simmons, cut our losses, and trade him for something that they don't want to trade him for? They want an all-star type of guy back. That's just not available in the marketplace right now. Damian Lillard, Bradley Beal, those types of guys are not available right now. But as of now, uh, you know, to me, it, it just is what it is. Ben Simmons is two feet out the door. The Sixers just don't feel like they have enough. Yeah, and as we get closer and closer to that regular season, somebody will blink. Somebody will flinch. But right now, it doesn't seem like Ben Simmons is going to do either of that as we get closer to the open of the NBA regular season. All right, gentlemen, let's switch coasts and go into the coast of L.A., the California, the state of California, where the Lakers are going to have a different look when they take the court for the first time this year. And Shams went in-depth with how L.A. acquired Russell Westbrook in a draft night blockbuster this offseason. We highly recommend strongly suggest that you check it out on The Athletic. Let's take a closer look at this deal. And Shams, the most interesting thing that you learned while during doing this reporting for this story was what? To me, it's just the player empowerment, right? Is that the moment that Russell Westbrook got a tip from someone uh, the morning of the draft that the Lakers were going to move on and make that buddy heel trade. Russell Westbrook went straight to Ted Leonsis, the Wizards owner, I'm told, and, and told Ted Leonsis, I want this trade. Get me out of Washington. Uh, and I would prefer to be with the Lakers. And he made his desire known that he wanted to be a Laker. And obviously that softened the stance for the Wizards, who at that point had no intention really to move Russell Westbrook or engage in any talks. Tommy Shepard, the GM there, reaches out to Rob Palenka in L.A. and decides uh, to try to come together on a deal that made sense for both sides. And listen, the Wizards ended up with three rotation players that could help them moving forward. But Russell Westbrook getting what he wants, player empowerment, that's what this era to me is about. Yeah, this is a huge blessing for that Lakers franchise to get Russell Westbrook. And Pat, I know you never take off your front office guru hat. So you've been involved in a lot of uh, big moves uh, when it comes to trades when, when your time uh, was there with NBA front offices. So uh, how touching go are these situations when you're trying to build a championship roster? 
Well, they're they're always touch and go when the, when most of the negotiations are taking between taking place between two front offices, uh, because that's where each side is trying to, to gain the maximum amount of leverage, get the most out of the deal. What, what was unique about this deal, though, was was it, it bypassed the front offices from the beginning with Russell Westbrook going to Ted Leonsis, uh, Ted Leonsis, the owner of the Washington Wizards, blessing the deal. Um, the Lakers getting Jeannie Buss on board, and, and so after that was done. Uh, both front offices knew that they had to do the deal, uh, and, and so I think it was much easier for, for a deal like this, which in a lot of other circumstances would be really difficult to pull off, uh, to make that happen. Uh, the, the timing also helped, uh, I might add, just being an, it, right at the time of the draft with that 22nd pick coming into play, um, you, you know, that everything worked out perfectly to, to put this team together. Yeah, no doubt at all. And a lot of people are intrigued to see how this L.A. team will look as we start the regular season and if they could eventually win an NBA championship with this roster that they have. All right, guys, let's switch lanes and focus in on the other team in L.A., and that's the Los Angeles Clippers. And their star, Kawhi Leonard, signed a long-term max deal with the Clippers this offseason despite coming off an ACL tear. And he explained why at media day. The best situation for me was to do it one-on-one and, one and then opt out and sign a long-term five-year deal. But there's a lot of concern that that brings up for you guys and your job and it creates storylines that I'm going to leave the team after one year. I want to secure some money and I wanted to be able to come back if I was able to this year. Pat, we expected that Kawhi was going to miss probably the entire season with this injury. So what do you make of his comments on Media Day about his status? Well, first, this is a, a degree of openness that I, I don't think any of us are used to seeing from Kawhi. He, he's usually a guy that's pretty tight-lipped about his intentions. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and how he's approached his free agency before this has always been kind of from a stone-cold business perspective. And so for him to come out and honestly say, like, look, if I did a one and one that would be the story of the whole year. It would be a distraction. And also to let us in on the fact that he really wants to, to play this season and, and being honest about the fact that if he did sign that one and one all the incentives would have been for him to just sit out the season knowing that he could have signed that five-year max deal uh, after this year and, and to come back at full speed. So, so I think that was really uh, an interesting uh, insight, I think, into his thinking and a degree of openness that, that we just really haven't seen before for Kawhi. There's just one thing about that refreshing word of distraction and not being a distraction. And Kawhi Leonard understands that he's not wanting to do that with the Clippers. And Sean's with Kawhi. He's had some injuries over the past few seasons. So with this particular injury with that ACL, and he left the door really kind of open of him possibly returning this season. From the Clippers standpoint, how are they going to approach a possible return for Kawhi to the court? Yeah, Cam, the Clippers are going to be really patient with Kawhi Leonard. And I think they've wanted to keep the door open for him to return at some point late in the season or the playoffs. There's been skepticism around the league, whether that's actually possible. But listen, Kawhi Leonard came out yesterday, said he's going to be day-to-day. -day. He came out this week, said he's going to be day-to-day. -day. And so I, I think that's really the approach that you're going to have with a guy like Kawhi Leonard is when he feels like he's ready to go, there'll be a go and give him the green light to play. Uh, and it's clear from his comments that he wants to play this year, which is a great sign for the Clippers. Yeah, and that's one of the situations that the Clippers are in. If they have a guy, uh, Pat and Paul George, where he really stepped up when Kawhi was out, that can help them kind of delay or just give Kawhi a little bit more time to return in, to the court and, and really strengthen his rehab. So um, from PG's standpoint, as he enters the regular season, what's that mindset that you think that he has going into this Clippers season? Well, well, I think it's going to just be coming and, and do more of the same that he did when Kawhi went down, where he averaged close to 30 points, 10 assists, six rebounds. You know, I, I don't know if we're going to see that kind of production over the course of a full season for him. But in a lot of the ways, when, when you're talking about superstars like Paul George, um, who have to go to, to, you know, secondary roles, if we're going to call it that, a lot of times that's a difficult adjustment to make. And so going back into a position – 